gonna keep it low now If you wanna go, let's go Let's wrap it up and hit the road Well, we did it. We are sitting out on our porch where we started this whole thing. Yep. And we have now completed our, well, this is our fourth day here in Havana. And it has been quite a trip, really remarkable trip for me. I, I just loved it. I thought it was a great yeah. time. It was something so different. I just realized looking at our passports that since we got our passports reissued, like, basically back in 2020, which was around COVID time. Um, we haven't been out of the country other than w the destinations we stopped at on our cruise, which right. they didn't ever stamp the passports no, on those destinations. On so no. uh, we need to do this more often. We need to leave the country yeah. more often. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. There's like a big festival going yeah. on across the street. Overall, just a great experience, something yeah. that I would absolutely say, yeah, let's do that again. Um, and, and just a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Can't wait to tell you more about it. Yeah. Um, you've seen a lot already, but we're, um, we're definitely wanting to share all of our thoughts about Americans visiting Cuba, how, um, how we can support, truly support the yeah. Cuban people, and um, just all, all that we've learned through this experience. So. I love doing experience like this. Yes. I'm glad we got to do it. Happy anniversary. Happy what anniversary. a great 20th anniversary celebration for us. Mm -hmm. um, doing something fun and different and also supporting Cuba. The yeah. people here are yeah. amazing people. So. Yeah. And speaking of amazing people, I think our Airbnb host is here to check us out. So Yeah, so we're getting ready to leave our Airbnb and then it's off to the airport. But we get the same driver that we had yeah. last night. He's so nice. He's going to come pick us up. All right, we are taking off out of Havana right now. Uh, been a great trip. Can't wait to do it again and come back and see everything again. But for now, we're heading back home. Can't wait to see the kids and, uh, and give them a big hug and get back to our things. Hey guys, I know that you just saw our flight land back in Denver from Cuba, um, but to bring you up to date, we've actually been home for quite a while starting now. So we wanted to make sure and sit down, we were very determined to sit down and really recap our trip. Um, you guys have seen the previous videos about Cuba. And what we wanted to do is Luke and I just wanted to sit down together and really talk about our trip to Cuba, what it meant to us, and the things that we actually learned and started to realize on each day while we were there. So this is kind of more to be able to sit down and, tr and really talk about what we learned and what we've been able to see after we've gotten home. And we just wanted to share with everyone. So if you are planning a trip to Cuba, you can learn from this as well. But also more about the fact that this was not really a vacation. Um, I would say that this was a trip and it was an experience and um, it was not lounging by the pool or just doing recreational things. It was really 
getting into Cuba and seeing the real Cuba for what it is. Yeah, we really didn't know what to expect um, other than kind of what we had heard from people who've been there before. Um, but we knew that it was going to be different. Um, and that's just from the very beginning. You know, it, it was even different because as an American traveling to Cuba, um, as we've stated before on, on the first video, the first Cuba video we posted, um, it's, there's, it's pretty restrictive from the State Department in terms of why you can go to Cuba. You can't go there uh, for tourism. You have to go there um, for one of 10 or 12 allowable reasons. And the, the most common allowable reason that people use to go to Cuba is support of the Cuban people. And that's, that's why we went. Um, so we knew it wasn't going to be uh, just tourism and just like mm -hmm. a tourist experience. We didn't even plan time to uh, go to the beach um, and relax. Yeah. Um, we wanted to be busy doing things the whole time we were there and, and kind of immersing ourselves as much as we could into the culture. And I know you, I know you can't do that perfectly because it's still going to be um, the experience of, uh, of a foreigner visiting and it's uh, tourism is a big part of their industry there. So uh, it's, we, we still, we know we couldn't live as a Cuban, but we definitely, I think, got to see the real Cuban uh, experience in terms of how people there live. And um, that's, that's kind of what I think it turned into. It was like an opportunity to see the people of Cuba and what they experience um, every day. And we did see that. Um, but before we went there, um, uh, we had to bring uh, enough cash, uh, US dollars, uh, to last us the whole time. None of our bank cards worked while we were there. None of our, our phones didn't work while we were there. So we had to make arrangements ahead of time um, to get a SIM card and a friend of mine had just been there and he had a SIM card. So I used that SIM card to actually get my phone to work while I was there. It's a Cuban SIM card. Um, and it had some, um, it had some minutes left on it. So I was able to recharge that and use that. Um, you can't even use the internet while you're there. So if you bring your computer, um, because the internet is restricted for Americans in Cuba, um, we, we actually, the only way around that is to actually set up and pay for a VPN service so that when you get on the internet in while you're in Cuba, the VPN makes your computer makes makes it look like your computer is accessing um, the internet from the United States. So it's very, it's very complicated, um, and you know we can go into more details on that. But really, the main point is you know bringing enough cash. That felt a little bit um, scary to be honest. It was just because I, I you know, as an American, you're kind of used to being able to. If you really need a lot of money quick, you can always put down a credit card and figure out how to pay for it later, but that wasn't an option no. there. Your um, cards don't work over there. And um, we, although they were, we were only there for three days, we brought probably three times the amount of cash that we thought we might need mm -hmm. just because I wanted to be on the safe side. And if for some reason we got stranded there or stuck there for any reason, I wanted to have at least a few days of buffer uh, to yeah. dig ourselves out of a problem. Yes. Uh, so the pre-planning of the whole thing was um, an experience in and of itself and it's not a trip that, as an American that you can take lightly. Now, if you're Canadian or most countries in Europe, you can go, and I, I found this out talking to a Canadian just the other day who, uh, can, Canadians love to vacation in Cuba and it's kind of an inexpensive vacation option for them. Mm -hmm. But the difference for them is they can stay at Cuban resorts which are government owned and run. And we, as Americans, we can't do that. Um, the State Department doesn't allow us to. Um, and so we have to prearrange our um, accommodations, which we did through Airbnb, um, and that money goes to um, a, a citizen, not to the people, not to the government. So it's very restrictive, um, and it takes a little bit of pre-planning to do it. It does. And every activity that we did, we were very deliberate about what we were doing. So, like, it, it goes back to we were not there just for leisure and for vacation. It was not. We Every day we were out um, really being deliberate about where we were going, who we were um, spending our money with, where, which restaurants, and um, making sure that we were uh, staying within those guidelines of we were going to support the Cuban people. So there were times it was stressful because we couldn't just go anywhere and say, oh, well, we're just going to do this. It was really trying to find our way and making sure that 
what we were doing was going to benefit the people of Cuba and stay within those guidelines. And so there were times where I think it took more work than usually what we would say on any of our other trips where you're just kind of going with it. But it was well worth it. So we're going to kind of start from the top of our trip um, and go over a few things and just talk about some points that really stood out to us. I hope you guys stay through this entire video because we do have some very eye-opening things to share with you that came to light to us as our trip kind of progressed. So we're going to talk about this from the moment that we arrived in Cuba to when we really started to see things how they really were. Um, so let's first of all talk about our arrival in Cuba. Um, it was we were excited. Um, I didn't really notice too much when we got into the airport. You know, we were just walking off the plane and you go straight into customs. And um, at that point, they receive us in customs and we both walked up to the agent together. And it, it was a female agent. And at this point, I think that's when we really realized um, communication was going to be tough. <laughs> um, it's you know if you travel to mexico or somewhere most of the time that they they can speak english but truly here it was not like just available anybody spoke english so we get up there and the agent um told i think she started telling luke i have to go back and we can only come up one at a time yeah, which is kind of odd because <laughs> most of the time when you go through customs uh, at least in the u.s every time i've come into customs in the u.s they always want the the whole group that is traveling together to come up at the same time. I don't I don't know why that is. There must be some reason. But this was she was very deliberate. She wanted me to stay up there and for Jill to go back. So yeah. Jill went back and stayed stayed in the line and waited for the next day. Yeah. So they they separated us. So um, I'll kind of let Luke tell you his story. But I waited back on the line and another agent called me forward to a different spot. Um, she asked for my passport. I gave her all the documentation. You do have to have a visa to go into Cuba. And how you obtain that visa is you actually, we were able to purchase it at the gate. So you get it at the departure gate before you leave. Um, I think it was in Houston. On your last leg. Yeah. Um, yeah, before you travel that international. So you do have to have a visa going into Cuba. Um, we got those before we left Houston. Um, so she asked me for my documentation. Um, they of course took a picture and I was through. She all of a sudden told me to walk through the gate. And I felt really strange because Luke was still over with the other agent and had not moved. And so I walk through the gate and I'm in Cuba and I stop and I turn around so I can <laughs> keep an eye on Luke. And Luke is now on the other side. So this is where I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, well, they're gonna let him through. And we waited and we waited and they were not letting him through. And I'll kind of let you take yeah, it so from your Yeah, so basically they just, they uh, kind of gave me, they hassled me a little bit. Like she was, um, she kept my passport. She kept trying to call somebody over and over again and no one would answer. Finally, she got a hold of somebody um, and I waited and then somebody came up um, to, to the, her booth and she handed this lady my passport and that lady proceeded to walk about 100 yards in the other direction to some office and went behind a door. And at this point, I'm not very comfortable with what's happening because obviously we're in a, um, a, a foreign country uh, trying to get through customs and now my passport, um, and now I do have a backup passport card, but my physical passport is in the hands of somebody and it's completely out of my behind sight. So I don't doors. know what they're doing with it. I don't know what's going on. And I'm just standing there waiting. And of course, Jill's on the other side of the gate um, already having entered Cuba. So I'm, I patiently wait and all of a sudden this guy comes up to me and about five to 10 minutes have passed already. So it felt like an eternity. And this guy comes up to me and he's very nice. And he was in a suit and he um, asked me a couple questions. He's asked me how long I'm planning to stay in Cuba. He asked me um, if I was traveling with anybody else. And I pointed to Jill who you could see across the gate and and he said okay thanks very much and he let me go and then i went right through so i mean it didn't last real long but it was definitely a, a kind of strange first introduction to cuba and um 
although like neither one of us panicked, you know, it was sort of just unsettling a little bit mm -hmm. to have that happen. But then um, we got out there and it was immediately like exciting to be in Cuba and see once we got our bags, then we got to see like we walked out on the curb and there's these cars that are driving by that are like like stepping back in time. These cars, 1950s cars, 1940s cars are amazing. And uh, the gentleman who was there to meet us had held up a sign with my name on it. And of course, we um, he ended up, as you could see from the previous videos, we got into his old 1940s uh, car, which is just yeah. beautiful. So that was our first, everything had changed at that point, And we were feeling happy to be there and, and comfortable where we were. By the way, everybody that we came into contact with was super friendly. Our, yes. our impressions, our first impressions of Cuba in terms of the people couldn't have been better. I mean, everybody was just smiling and very friendly. Um, there was always that communication barrier because pretty much no one spoke English, <laughs> yeah. but um, that's okay. Like it, we were in their country and um, and we knew that it was our responsibility to kind of bridge the gap on the language barrier. So we figured out Google Translate is our friend. Um, you can speak into your phone and it will speak. Uh, you can actually have a conversation with somebody by just holding the phone and it'll repeat your English words in Spanish, and it'll rep repeat their Spanish words in English. Really, really brilliant uh, technology, which yeah. helped a lot. Um, but you do notice, like, poverty is a real deep thing there. I think I've been to a lot of other third world countries before, and um, the, the, the difference for me that I noticed with the poverty that I saw is that um, although you see uh, pretty intense poverty in places like Kenya, where I've been before, um, in, in like in the slums areas and things like that, um, the 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 word that keep coming came kept kept coming to my mind was oppression. Yes. Like this, it was this heavy oppressive feeling, and I really what we figured out later is it was the government oppression on the Cuban people is what's tangible there. Um, people um, in Kenya, for example. Are, could might be living in extreme poverty, but they have a, the sm smiling from ear to ear and just happy with their circumstances because they're alive. And mm -hmm. and I think um, the poverty, although maybe not as intense in most areas of Cuba, I'm sure some, um, it was definitely there. And people are scraping by, but there's just this pr oppression that they live under because of the government there. Yeah. And you and just we'll, really can you can really notice that there. So yeah. and we'll cover more on that um, here in a little bit. So. We get in the car, um, we definitely start seeing the real, you know, just Cuba. And um, I'm sure for many of you, just like Luke and I, you hear about it and you hear about um, the old cars that are there and it's like it was frozen in time. Um, it really was. And so we pull up the air to our Airbnb and once again, um, for American citizens, you cannot stay in any hotel there because the hotels are government owned. The resorts are government owned. And so you need to book through an Airbnb and that's what we did. And it was absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you guys can see that in the previous video. But one thing we, that we talked about in that video was Luke had ordered flowers um, to be there in our airbnb and i love that um you know i love flowers and we arrived on our anniversary which yeah is our 20, it 20 was year anniversary. our 20th anniversary and so to have the flowers there it meant a lot but what i have learned now um and we actually didn't know about this until about day three that for the host to get those flowers there that was not just some small task to go down to the a corner store and grab a bouquet of flowers that that just does not exist in Cuba um, there is not just a florist that is available so this person had to know somebody who knew somebody who then knew somebody that was able to get those flowers it was a big ask that I never would have thought and so that made those flowers mean so much more to me um, than I think any other flowers you've gotten <laughs> for me. Um, and just the length that the host had to go to to get those flowers. So that is really, you know, I didn't realize this until into about day two of our trip of how hard it was for him to get those flowers. Um, but you start to kind of see things um, once, once we got there. That first night we went to our restaurant and 
we looked at the menu and we started ordering stuff off the menu and they said oh we don't have that we don't have that this is a common experience we found out in yes Canada. and that first night we're like oh well i think there was a couple times we we're like why and they're like we just don't have it so <laughs> Um, that first night, I would definitely say we were naive to what was going to be revealed to us later. Yeah. Um, we still made sure that we were eating local. That was our big thing is we were very aware of where we were eating to make sure it was not government owned um, or anything because you do want to support the people of Cuba. And the whole thing with the ordering off the menu is um, we what we learned is the best thing to do is just ask them what they have because since every restaurant and every store well, there aren't many stores but every restaurant or place where you can buy something that's not government owned is technically black market that the government sort of permits to uh, exist um, because of that every time they want to get meat to cook and to have on their menu or to have pasta or to have a certain dish or whatever they have to hunt it down and find it it has to come yes through difficult sourcing um, and it's not like they can just go down to the market and pick a bunch of things for the mm -hmm. day. Uh, they're Usually they have um, back channel sources to get uh, certain things and if that source runs out then they have to change up. So they print these menus but they really don't mean anything because what you want to do is say what do you have and what they, whatever they have is usually the best thing anyway because it's probably fresh and something that they are proud to serve and that they're it's kind of their special yeah. um, and we learned that and when we learned that things got a lot easier because we ended up eating what they had yeah. and what they had was typically very good very good so that brings us to um, where we really started to realize what it was like for the Cuban people is when we spent the day with our incredible host that took us out to Vinales and our driver that day. We were able to talk, I think it was a two hour drive? Yeah, about the two hours. It was a two hour drive one way and I will tell you that... Oh, I just gotta say this, Vinales Valley, which is where we went that day, if you didn't get a chance to see that video, please go back and watch it. You, won't, yeah. you will not regret seeing the, that part of Cuba. The scenery that we captured on the video is some of my favorite scenery we've ever captured. Yes. It's just beautiful. And we actually got to go to a tobacco plantation and, and see and learn. And it was just, it's one of my favorite videos just because of the experience it was for me yeah. and, and how beautiful the, the scenery was. But yeah. anyway, back to the trip. So Well, back to that. So I will tell you out of all the days in Cuba that we spent, um, that was my most memorable day. Oh, for sure. It was not just because of the beautiful scenery. I mean, it was gorgeous, but what made it so memorable to me is that is when my eyes were open because we were able to talk with our host and our driver that entire day. And learning what I have learned, um, it is very eye-opening. I will tell you that it is also to me heartbreaking um, to hear what these people are, are dealing with. Um, and it really opened my eyes to what Luke and I were seeing. And so in that two hour drive just to the plantation, we were able um, to have conversations and learn what it means and what were some of the things that we were seeing. Uh, our second day there, Luke and I were just out walking around and um, we noticed it was like a, it was a gas station, but then it was also like, it looked like a storefront, but the door is blocked and there's this long line of people. And we're like, wow, I wonder what they're doing or what they're lined up for. And we, we weren't sure if it was the bank or what it was. Because there was long, long lines of the bank for exchanging money. That's yes. a big thing there too. Which That's another that, thing. You could do a whole video on just the whole money exchange and how yeah. corrupt and weird that whole thing is. Oh my gosh. So later we learned on day three what those lines of people were, where they were lined up to get their rations. And that's where I learned um, there is just not a typical grocery store that, let's say for the average American, Canadian, European, you run out of something, you go to the store, you go get it. 
That doesn't happen in Cuba. They are given the even, Cuban... By the way, even in third world countries that I've been to, if you want to go to... A grocery um, store. A grocery store. Like, well, I, when we were when, in Kenya... When we were in Kenya, there was a store that was like a Walmart. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> it, a Walmart, but it, but it was a it store. Was, it was like a Walmart. It was huge. It was like a warehouse store. And there was tons of stuff you could buy. Now, m maybe a lot of people didn't have the money to actually go there and buy because there's a lot of people in poverty, but it existed. So it if you available. did have money, you could go buy anything you needed. That this doesn't exist in does Cuba. not exist in Cuba. At and least not that is, we have found. <laughs> yeah. And this is where it really hit me. Um, the Cuban people are given a notebook and it's just this little notebook and it's got a date and they are rationed. And so I think it's on a monthly basis, once a month, once a month, they go to whatever their designated area is where they live in their district, mm -hmm. in their district. And there's somebody sitting there at the door. It's a government official and they're looking at their notebook and they'll initial it. Then they go to the door and they're handed their rations for that month. You don't always know what you're going to get. Um, for the most part, I think from what I'm understanding, they do get some flour, not always sugar. You don't always get sugar. Um, there is rice chicken chicken and um water but the chicken for example for one person for a month is like three pounds of chicken i mean that for one person for one per so mm -hmm. it's and and over the years these rations have been they changed shrinking yeah. and diminishing diminishing more um, and more and more which is caused the people to have to rely more and more on the black market just to yes. survive yeah just to live so um, it's, it's divided up between certain rations and that's what they get per person, per household, per month. And uh, talking to our host, she said, it's been forever since we've seen eggs. Sometimes mm -hmm. all of a sudden they'll get eggs in their rations, other times you just don't get them. Um, but it's not only that, they do not have available to them toothpaste. They don't have Tylenol, they don't have ibuprofen. So if you run out or if your kid's running a fever, you don't just go to the CVS or the Walmart or anywhere and go get Tylenol or Advil. It is something that is very rare. And um, how these people and how these restaurants are working is once again, it's like a black market and they go and they find pasta for that day. And so these restaurant owners are really getting what they can get for that day to be able to do their business. But it doesn't just stop there. Their business, if they woke up the next morning and the government came to them and said, this is now ours, there's no questions asked. They just take it and it's gone. They lose everything. Yeah, actually, the, one of the last nights we were there, um, our driver, um, the wonderful Jose, who we met there, um, he uh, told us a story through Google Translate, by the way. It took us about 20 minutes, but it was it was but amazing. But it was a good conversation. It was worth every minute. Yes. Um, he told us a story of his family's farm that had been in their family for three or four generations. And his father one day um, was there, and the government came along and took it. And from that point on, that farm was gone. It wasn't theirs. And that 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 just it's just mind-blowing and, and by the way when we were at the plantation i mentioned this in the last video but 90 percent of the crops that they harvest go straight to the government so tobacco leaves 90 percent of those tobacco leaves are are taken by the government so that the government then can take them to the factories of all the main cigar brands cohibas and these big famous cigar brands from cuba and then they process them and turn them into cigars, but they sell them at like a 2,000% markup from what the locals sell the cigars with the same exact tobacco leaves. So um, they, they take the 90% of the crop and then they mark it up 2,000% or more um, and, and sell it um, to, to tourists all over the world. Uh, that that was really eye-opening for me not just about cigars and the tobacco but that it's like for any crop they they basically have the rights to the crops and the farmers can't even um, use tractors or any uh, like any gas equipment or any machinery to actually do the work on the farm it all has to be done with animals and with manual labor which makes it so much harder so they to make it harder the for them and then they take 90% of what they work for 
that is uh, that's the real Cuba. That's and that's when we talk about like kind of eye opening. That's what we saw. Yes. That was like really eye opening for us. Um, yeah. So the the availability of of stuff and i i tell you ever since i've been home you know i've run out of something i'm just gonna run to the store really quick it, it's hit me harder mm -hmm. because i think of the people that we met and i think about them daily that they can't just go to the store and hopefully find something or just go get it um so it it definitely has made me appreciate it more but i can't just stop thinking about these people that are oppressed in this way. And I know that there's a lot of oppression in this world, but to see it firsthand and um, to hear also, you know, from the younger generation there, their, their hope is in leaving Cuba. They all wanna get they out. They want to get out. I don't think we met anybody there who, especially a younger person who like wasn't aspiring to leave the island mm -hmm. like that that is their dream is to get out mm -hmm. and then you do meet the older people who are who are a little more content and i think they're content because they know that the chances of them ever getting out are pretty much gone so yes. they've kind of lost hope on that and they just figure well they've been here long enough you might as well just mm -hmm. make the most of it and and live out yes. but it, it people want to leave and and a lot of people have lost their lives trying to leave um that there's tens of thousands if not more of people who um, have made tried to fashion boats and make some sort of rafts just to try to uh, cross that 90 mile um, uh, piece of water of ocean between um, between Cuba and Florida yeah. um, and and you know many have been successful but many 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 have died in the process yeah and um, so once again learning on that day to Vanalis just what we were able to talk about. Um, also, how they, they, the government controls their people is if they feel that there's too much um, uprising, the rations go down, they do blackouts, they, they cut electricity, mm -hmm. and then the gas. That's another thing. Um, we saw gas stations, and um, that's once again, second day. And we didn't know re really where we were going and we just needed a cab or something. And we were at the gas station and there was this long line of cars. And we're like, oh, they're probably just waiting for it to open. Or, you know, and so we had no idea what was, what really goes on with the gas there until we were driving to Vanalis and we heard and we were driving by gas stations and they would point out and you'd see these long line of cars and to find out they'd been there since four o'clock in the morning, waiting for the pumps to open, not knowing if they're gonna open that day. It's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And whether or not the, the government gonna, brings gas. And they're mm -hmm. waiting on the government to bring gas to fuel up their car. And some people wait eight hours just standing by their mm -hmm. car in hopes that the gas arrives. It's yes. pretty amazing. And if they're a driver, a taxi driver or anything, and gas doesn't show up that day, they don't work the next day mm -hmm. until they can get gas. And so government will also cut fuel in times of uprising or anything like that to once again oppress the people to keep them in line. So to hear these stories, I can't imagine waiting at a gas station for eight hours, not even knowing if you're gonna get fuel for your car that day. But that is what is going on over there. So learning all of this and um, learning you know, from a younger generation that their only hope or they feel that their only hope is to leave that country, um, it, it's just eye-opening and gut-wrenching at the same time. So I, I think, you know, coming away from this and seeing the two videos that we have released, I know it looks great. And I will tell you, the Cuban people have been some of the sweetest, mm -hmm. kindest, welcoming people I have ever met. And it's a beautiful country. It's beautiful so rich country. in resources. Yes. It's really pretty. It really is. Um, you know, uh, Havana is gorgeous I, I love the city you know you can go walk and there was points yes you walk into some um, poverty a lot of it is poverty there 
But at never one point did I feel unsafe or unwelcome. Everybody, even though when we were walking, we were not hounded, we were not um, bothered as what you sometimes can be in other travel places, but you were also just, the people were so welcoming and so kind and willing to share their story with us that it, it really um, kind of, it just made it that much more of an experience. Yeah, and I would say like the driver we had to Vinales and the host that, that took us, um, and then uh, Jose, our, our driver, who took us to the airport and took us around the night before we left, um, that like I, I still keep up with these people because um, there are people I would stay in contact with the rest of our lives. They're very special people. They're yeah. they're they're very genuine. But I, I think Jill hit it right. They they really wanted to share with us, and they had just met us. But because we were interested, they took the opportunity and really wanted to share with us their story, um, as though they wanted to become lifelong friends. And and, and again, like we still keep up on on WhatsApp and yeah. are able to connect. Remember, this country only got internet seven years ago. Yes. And so it has completely changed the country uh, in so many ways. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that our host said that kind of opened my eyes is, um, her, in her opinion, um, the internet um, didn't necessarily reveal to Cuban people what the real outside world is like, yeah. but it did. it has started to reveal to the outside world what Cuba is really like. And I was like, wow, I never thought of it that way. Because I thought just people who had never seen internet before suddenly getting it overnight. You know, in, in America and in Western society, we, we had this gradual increase of internet over the last 20, 30 years. Theirs happened like that in one night, almost yeah, it was like, like one year. On it was and... turned on and they had it. And so, of course, they're, they're learning a lot about other things and other cultures, but a lot of it in their hope is that other cultures learn about uh, them. And I'll, I would say this, and you know you know us if you watch our channel we don't ever ask uh, uh very rarely will we ask you to share our videos i i firmly believe that um there's a good chance that this video will be suppressed by the algorithms because of yes what we're saying and i would just love it if this video got out there more and that uh, more people got to kind of learn um at least from our perspective and i know it's just one perspective but what we saw there mm-hmm. and um kind of our takeaway so if you like what you've learned in this uh, video i'd love it if you could share that uh, with your friends and family yes. and hopefully they'll um they'll uh, see it as well and hopefully um you or other people you know might be inspired to actually visit um and learn about the people of cuba and support them in any way we can Yeah, um, one more thing I wanted to kind of go over before we end our video is if any of you are traveling into Cuba for supporting the Cuban people or for missionary purposes um, and you have not been, one thing that we also learned while we were there is the value of the money um, there, especially US dollars. And we learned that if you're going to go there and you've got you have to have cash make sure the bills that you are carrying are in pristine shape Mm -hmm. um this is just another way that the government kind of oppresses the people if they take that to a bank the government will say this is no good if it has a little tiny tear in the bill or a, a, a fold that's really creased um, and looks like it might be starting to tear, they'll, they'll reject it. They won't take it. Even if it's a hundred dollar USD, mm-hmm. they won't take it. And so, uh, luckily we had bills like yeah. there was, I would say several hundred dollars that we brought what we couldn't use because, um, and luckily we didn't need it cause we had brought extra, but, um, we, we couldn't use it because it had, it was folded too much or it had some tears or mm-hmm. folds on the side. And so, yeah, great point. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you remember that one, but bring clean crisp uh not 50s, torn, hundreds, not like wrinkled no bills. pin mark yeah. on them yeah. nothing any marks they'll, they'll they won't they, take it. it and it's it's not that they're trying to be picky it's the fact that the bank it's worthless it's they worthless won't take it. they're, they're like it means nothing mm-hmm. so um just make sure that you have that uh but honestly after sitting down and and um kind of talking over what we truly experienced and what was eye-opening to us. 
I would still say I would do this trip over again and again. Um, it has opened my eyes to a people that I feel like have possibly been forgotten. Um, and it's, I feel like the people are being punished because their government made bad choices. Mm -hmm. And it's not the government that's suffering, it is the people. And, um, you know, there are so many places across the world that are, are having problems. And I agree, we, we need to pray for each and every one of them. But I just ask that you guys pray for the Cuban people and that you guys truly know what is really going on over there. And I think it is just misconceived a lot of the times and and you walk in and you can truly see it and hear it from the people and i hope what we shared with you today like luke said please share this video with others and and get the word out but um for the people that we connected with in cuba we think about you guys every day and those relationships are gonna be lifetime relationships. Like we are keeping in contact with them and I'm so happy to have those people that yeah. we call friends and, now. And if you are watching and you're in Cuba, I hope we've done good justice to uh, uh, your country and, and the people there. Um, I realize that our experience isn't the same as everyone else's and even the people that we met might not be the experience of other people, but. Uh, I do think it's important to share our perspective just because it's one perspective we recognize it's not everyone's. Um, yeah. But um, I think the thing I would say is to the Cuban people is we love the Cuban people, the people we met and, and the country. Um, it's just a beautiful uh, country and beautiful people. And um, although our experience kind of revealed a lot to us and it wasn't all positive, um, I, I have a lot of hope for um, for the people there and that one day um, they'll be able to freely come and go uh, from their country and not be yeah. oppressed by the government. Um, and I think that if, if there was some way for them to freely come and go, I do think that um, they would not just leave and never come back, but I think it's such a beautiful place they would leave and, and come back and, and yeah. um, be able to support their family there. So. Um, yeah, that was a lot to share, um, but again, hopefully it was helpful and, um, and gave you some perspective. And if you haven't yet, please go back and watch uh, the other videos that we posted. And um, we're gonna move on from Cuba after this. And we have a lot of exciting new stuff to share with you because we haven't been posting a lot because our lives have been busy, but we've been capturing a lot. And yes. so there's some great things coming <laughs> right around the corner and we're gonna try to post a little more often again yeah. like we always do. So um, more, co more coming at you soon. Yeah, um, as always guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.